Welcome to yet another episode of Say What, this time with Mr. Christopher Leonard Jackson. This is the man growing up in Virginia, playing the violin and then shifted to bass and developed over the years a very unique sound that you would get many examples of in this episode. But it's also a man who started a movement with the words of spreading good vibes and positive energy throughout the universe as he self-described it. The concept of Leonard's many moods that combines different kind of genres, musical expression in the realm of funk and soul music, of course. And throughout different places in the world, Greece and Spain and Poland and all over the world, he tried to develop this concept that unites people and just spreading the positive energy you get to hear a lot about that in this episode, but also his way from Virginia to New York and ending up as the front man who developed the whole foundation of the, the groove, the club in New York that was the absolute hotspot for all of the musicians. Prince, Shaka Khan, everyone was there. This was the place to be and how did it end up being that? This is the story about Leonard, the bass player, the singer, the songwriter, the concert arranger, producer, love spreader through his amazing bass playing. Wow. Enjoy. Glad to have you aboard on board as a guest here, Leonard. So um, yeah, grateful to be on board. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Man. This show is about the love of music, the love of soul and funk music, and that's why we started this. When you, when we see clips on your playing on YouTube from the the Grove, and when we saw you in the Minneapolis, I had the opportunity to do that at the Dakota Jazz Club. Right. Man, it, it's it, I guess there's no music lover in the world that cannot uh, be amazed by your playing of the bass it's so it's it's amazing so uh, you really describe and uh, love in music while just the way you play it so uh, wow well, thank, thank you, you for that thank you very much thank you very much uh, uh yeah, yeah I, well, you know, music is it really feels like it's just part of me it's part of who i am yeah. who i've been all my life so you just feel like it's part of my nature to be playing you know Smack it loud. Come get to Tell them who you are. Everything was so cool at that place. Uh, 
I remember that the walls was painted with musicians and all kinds of stuff. I just was amazed of uh, the music that you played and everything was so professional. So I'm very happy to have met you there and to be able to to hear your stories a little bit about Shelby J and Prince was at the Grove too, I, I, I reckon. And so why don't you tell us a little bit how you started and how you came to the Grove and what artists you met? Uh, we talked about Prince and Shelby and so on before. What, what was your music life before and how did you come to the Grove and where are you today? Um, well, I mean, I started out as a very young kid, four years old, singing in gospel church, Baptist church in uh, Richmond, Virginia. So just where I'm from. And um, music kind of evolved through my school years. Uh, at first I was just singing at four years old. And at eight years old, I started to play the violin. Uh, that oh. was my first introduction to the in playing instruments. So, um, and being around in an orchestra, you start to experiment with all the other instruments that's in there. As a kid, you know, you want to mm-hmm. see how everything works. You know, of course, especially, of course, especially banging on the drums and the big timpani. You know, so and those sounds like that it was, uh, uh, you know, all of it was. Um, felt enriching to me, you know, those sounds. Uh, uh, so so theoretically, theoretically I, I really got into wanting to learn about each instrument. What, what was their role in, in, the, in the, when you start to write, play a song? And uh, so uh, that carried me through up until around the uh, eighth grade, I was in school. I first I wrote my first orchestra piece and directed it. Um, and uh, and then that next year, all the upright bass players graduated. So right. my hand was the biggest of the violin players. So they switched me to upright bass. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> which was really upsetting to me because I really started to like the violin and and being in that section. Uh, but that started my journey on the bass and uh, playing bass guitar, because after uh, playing start play upright, then I wanted to learn how to play the bass guitar because, you know, that was much cooler than the big upright bass, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, cause, started, uh, so because of your size, you, you have to change your instrument. That, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, because of, because of my hand. <laughs> yeah, it, was because, uh, it wasn't because of my height, because I stayed really short through school. Oh, yeah. school but because of my hands were so big, they switched me to, to upright yeah. bass. Yeah, y- so. You mentioned gospel and orchestral pieces and stuff like that. Did you have any role models at that young age? Uh, was it someone in the family or was it someone... Role well, model, role model uh, yeah. Well, it was everybody in my family because everybody in my family pretty much sang in church, you know. So, uh, uh, especially my mother and father, they both uh, were singing in the choir, and my dad had his own singing group. Uh, and uh, so, they pretty much were my role models, uh, along with, you know, uh, my dad always played uh, Mahalia Jackson's music around the house. Um, uh, Aretha Franklin's music because you know Aretha always was in church and doing uh, uh, what they call you know popular music, secular music at that time. So she was always in and out, along with uh, Al Green and people like Sam Cooke. Oh, wow. all the great ones. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So all those guys was doing both gospel music and. Um, the mainstream pop music. Uh, so um, uh, those guys, I would hear them all the time in the house. So yeah, that well, music became a heavy influence. Well, isn't that pretty amazing? Because still till this day, I mean, every once in a while when we meet Tim, yeah, it's those names again. Aretha Franklin, Al Green, Sam yeah. Cooke, It's yeah, like Temptations, absolutely. Ohio Players. We, man, we, we listen to those.
you you were in the eighth grade or something and you have changed to the to the base and uh, yeah what happened in those years and the way to the to the groove and where you are at now the platform you have established for yourself yeah yeah when, when i was eight years old uh, uh well in the eighth grade uh and started really play the bass and started to really get into it it took me a, about a year to really get my mind into where I had made the change now from from bass to from violin to bass because I really didn't want to make that transition but uh it was just that was well, really you could almost could say it was destined uh mm. how things worked out you know but uh uh we are so thankful for that <laughs> <laughs> well I'm thankful too because it, it it allowed me now to like meet you guys and do all the things I've done around the world mm. uh but um Uh, when I was 13 years old, the only way I could get a bass guitar was I had to play in my father's singing group. So I had to still stay connected to church. Uh, so, uh, but uh, once I got the, the bass guitar, uh, I still approached it like I was playing the violin. So this is kind of like how I developed my own approach to playing bass. So this is why. Who did it describe that process? Yeah, well, when you when you hear a lot of stuff that I do on the bass, I really try to use the instrument as a melodic instrument and play a lot of melodic lines on it uh, and doing solo section when I'm improv and and and, uh, and, I, and I always had an affinity when I started playing instruments. I wanted to play drums before, mm -hmm. before before they made me play violin. So I always wanted to. I try to use the the bass guitar mm -hmm. as like drums. Especially when I heard Larry Graham, oh, yeah, the slap technique. You know, yeah. When he was with Sly Stone, and he came out with that "Thank You" thing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, "Be Myself" song. I want yeah. to thank you, be myself, and he was playing with his thumb, and that was kind of like the first kind of introduction to that style of playing. Yeah, that and was that, totally groundbreaking, the Larry Graham yeah. technique back then. Yeah. yeah, yes, and it was like it was like a light came on for me. Yeah. It was like I, all of a sudden I never didn't want to really play my fingers anymore. I just wanted to play that kind of style. We went duo, but see the thing of it is, is after we didn't have drums, it caused a problem. See, I kind of miss not having that backbeat mm -hmm. and that snare drum, so I had to uh, kind of compensate. But now, interesting. See, I came to the bass from the guitar, and we had an old organ in the club, and I used to play the bass with my foot. See. While I was playing the guitar, but now since it was like a duo and we didn't have that organ, I went and rented me a bass. In the meantime, till we get to you know, get the old organ fixed, mm -hmm. but the organ was too old; it couldn't be fixed. So I ended up keeping the bass, and then when we ended up without the drummer, I started thumping to make up for not having a bass drum. Right? Okay, so that kind of made it for the bass drum, but now uh, the snare drum thing, I had to compensate for that too. So I did a little thumping in the plucking layer. Like this. Mm, mm, thing, ah. But it's interesting you describe it like you're playing it. You were approaching it like the violin, and I. Yeah. There's something I know that Prince, when he talked about his guitar playing, he said that, well, 
I don't think about the guitar. I think like I'm singing through it. It's like well, that's how it's like how uh, I because it's like you you like you can still play melody through it. So uh, it's like everything I play, it's like I'm singing. Well, my music teacher told me everything that you can sing, you should be able to play on your instrument. So that's true. Yeah. So when I was singing out, I was singing out first before I would actually try to play it. And once I sang it, I could, it was auto, it was easy for me to play it. So it took you one, two, three years there to kind of get yeah, your to kind of like really settle into playing the bass yeah. and things, and uh, uh, and and then I got introduced into the business, the music business, the entertainment business, as a sound man, running sound for uh, one of the top groups in Virginia called Ujima. At that time, I was 14, and uh, my brother used was uh, part of their road crew, okay. and. So I started to just go to their shows, uh, and uh, they were like the top band around. And they were Atlantic Records was about to sign them, so they used to do a lot of opening acts for the main acts that would come into town. So, so by running sound for them, I started to meet Patty LaBelle. Wow. I met Patty LaBelle when she was with the Blue Bells with Nona Hendrix, yeah, 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 Sarah Dash. I, so I met them when I was like 14, 15 years old, and then, and then I met Curtis Mayfield. Uh, uh, and, and guys like that. Uh, such a was, great learning, such a great school to be able to just watch and learn from the great ones. Yeah, from those guys, I guess. yeah, yeah, right. and watch how to how to to work the audience and, mm-hmm. and 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 but but the best thing was even before the shows was watch how they put their shows together doing sound check. That was the amazing part, and how they and how they were getting their sound. Because I was there running sound, so I yeah. had to like, you know, I had to like, I was part of building their sound while yeah. I was in these places. And so, you, were, you were so young, and you had you have to take the perspective of their approach to it and their wishes for the music, and it's like, yeah, well, see, I, yeah, I didn't have any approach. So the thing mm. was, I was <laughs> my, my whole uh, knowledge now was based on what they were telling me. This is what they wanted. This was the reason why they wanted it that way. So, uh, uh, so. That really helped shape um, how I approach things as I continue to move forward. I was really kind of forced in that situation. A guy asked me to put a, put together a show for this singing group called the Waller Family, okay. and I put the show together because now at that age, now as I started to get older, I would became I was a I was almost I was a pretty successful sport athlete in a, in a, uh, going through high school playing baseball football and basketball uh the, but the baseball and football thing started to really materialize like there's gonna be something i was going to do as a career mm. and uh matter of fact i made the kansas city royals baseball team try it oh. out wow so you were a bit uh, on defense of what you're gonna <laughs> choose yeah, I then yeah. i guess yeah. i didn't know really what i want to do so i used to sit down and talk to my parents all the time and they used to say you just got to focus on one thing and kind of stick to it and I used to tell them, look, I'm gonna be a professional, no matter what this, which way I go, I'm gonna be a professional. Mm. So that was my whole mindset. Whatever I was gonna do, I was gonna be a professional. Not taking the time to be a bully, a prepare for obstacles we go through in time, in life, stabbing our own self in the back. With the knife, take the time to take the time to uh, hey, 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 take the time to take the time to uh, hey, uh, hey, hey, take the time to take the time to uh, hey, hey, uh, hey, hey, take the time to take the time to I wanted to always be good at as as good as they were or better 
Wow. It and, sounds, and, sounds like that you have a, a very good uh, support from your network and parents. And uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah, all good, yeah. it's all hard work. And I guess all it's the all big hard ones. Work. Well, see, all, that's, uh, there are no it, shortcuts I, in yeah, uh, yeah. perfection. Yeah, my mom was a hard worker all the time. Was like, you know, that's all she stressed was working hard. But my mom was work, 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 right? So, yeah. and that's what is still to me. Yeah, it was like a, a strong work ethic. So I used to practice five, six hours a day on, on either one, sports, music. So, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, so, so the years went by and you gained more experience from the sound and and then you kind yeah, of oh, I, I choose the musical side in uh well I, uh at, at 18 i put together this show for uh, the waller family and uh the interesting thing was the show was opening for stephanie mills it was wow yeah so at uh virginia union university at the homecoming show, at a homecoming concert and uh so the, after the show uh stephanie mills called me into her limousine and said Hey, your band is really, really good. You guys, I know y'all are young. You know, y'all have a great future ahead of you. And I said, no, this is not my band. This, oh. I just put the show to put this show together for these for these singers, and I, I'm going to go do something else. And she said, why would you want to do that? She said, you could have a long music career, and it could take you all over the world. So that was a game shifter to to get that kind of feedback. That, that was a. Matter of fact, that changed my whole perspective on what I wanted to do. one of the top bands in Virginia. But uh, I, we met this guy, Joe Jefferson, Joe Jefferson Jr. His father was one of the songwriters for the Spinners in, uh, at uh, Philadelphia International. Mm -hmm. He wrote the song, One of a Kind, Love Affair, uh, Mighty Love for the Spinners, yeah. and, uh, Brandy for the OJs. Uh, so he used to come down to see his son and he saw us in this little band that we had put together. And he started to kind of like give us little pointers on things, right? And so we was writing our songs. We made a demo tape mm -hmm. and he took it to some of his people up in uh, Philadelphia. Now, what we heard, the story we heard was they, these people up there liked our demo tape. Uh, but there was a, a guy already working with labels. They had a similar sound. That guy at that time was Prince. So we didn't get our situation set up uh -huh. because, you know, we had a sound similar to Prince. And now Prince, and they were saying, well, you guys are four musicians. This guy is playing everything himself. <laughs> so it's hard so, to compete to that, I guess. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, you know, and uh, so it's pretty interesting how like all those years, We, I kind of like almost came in contact with Prince back then. Mm. Uh, and uh, Prince's career started to really take off. So then the first year he came to Richmond, Virginia. Now I was hanging out with these promoters because now I had started, my band has started to become kind of like well known there. And so I used to be with all the promoters around. Okay. And Prince's first tour was opening for Rick James. Yeah. Yeah. So. That particular night they came to Richmond, Virginia. I was backstage with the promoter and I met Rick James and Prince at the same time. But but they were arguing. They were arguing with each other because Prince would always play overtime. You know, so so Rick James was upset with Prince and he was like, yo, man, you got to stop playing overtime. It was like it was this crazy conversation. Yeah. Because the promoter was saying, well, guys, I want y'all to meet uh, this guy, Chris Jackson, Leonard, he's a bass player. And they were like, they were like, they looked at me and then they just like went back arguing. <laughs> it was like, and I was like, so, man. So the rumors is true because there are so many rumors that they were kind of having their this 
Just fights. fights. These yeah, fights yeah, every now and then, was... and they, they didn't really get along. And uh, he was stealing his instruments, and they were kind of, yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of stuff. Wasn't it Prince who stole one of the keyboards there with the music? Oh, it, I think it was the opposite. Uh, Rick and James. Maybe it was the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> he, he stole uh, the, the synthesizers and uh, from Prince. Had a lot of stories from that. Yeah, but that's, uh, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Well, Prince used to play. Oh, you know, he had his he had his show that he would do, mm. and it was a certain you know it was a certain time limit, you know. But it was more than what Rick James had really given. It was supposed to be just 40 minutes, 40, mm. 45 minutes. Prince sometimes would play 50 minutes, especially if the crowd was really into it, you know. So, um, so every night it was to be some kind of argument. Because I went to three of their shows. They played Richmond, then they played wow. Hampton Roads, uh, Norfolk area, and then I went to one of the shows in DC. You, you used to see those shows back then, and to even meet them. And I want to get back to that, but uh, just to in in that period of time there he also did a tour of prince with with sap and roger and the time i think the year after that or, or what, what yeah and that yeah, was yeah. think about being there and to see those at the same yeah. night <laughs> those yeah, were yeah. the days wow uh, yeah, that, uh, that, that, yeah i think that the, well the, the the next year they gave prince his own show his own shows yeah That's and when I f- he, he introduced the time yeah so it just was the time in him And then yeah. the following year, they brought out Vanity. Yeah, yeah. So and Vanity, I, The Time, yeah. and Prince. That's what that toured for a couple of years too. But I, I saw. I was actually some some shows. tour legs when he also had uh, Sap and Rogers with him in uh, in some combination. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah But yeah. please take us back to the meeting. You, you you went backstage and you got introduced, but they were in the middle of a fight. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> yeah. what happened? Well, well, I mean, it was like you know. Rick was cursing at Prince for, for, for like again, once again playing him overtime, and Prince was just just stand there. He was just standing there. It's like you know, like he really wasn't even paying attention to to Rick, what Jamie was saying. And so it was kind of to me, it was kind of funny, you know, what I'm saying so. Uh, uh, So when Rick James stopped screaming, Prince just walked off. You know, yeah, they were kind of caught both of both of them, and I guess it was yeah, yeah both of them were really kind of arrogant and, and <laughs> egotistical. When we make it love tonight, sexy, 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 sexy. I really got to know the bass player for Rick James and uh, the keyboard player guy. He was a really, really cool guy. Uh, and, you know, they was from Buffalo. So, uh, so they was, they was really cool. But, uh, but th- those years, uh, I met a lot of artists that year uh, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, well, previously I already knew the guys from Cool in the Game. Uh, by opening up for them, our own band, opening up for them, but we open also with the Wilder family, we open up for, for Cameo. And um, uh, we had opened up for Betty Davis, mm. uh, um, Miles Davis' wife. And uh, uh, so I got to know all of those guys. But then when I was hanging out with those promoters, I met a lot of people. I met the Eddie Van Halen, all the Van Halen guys. Uh, what was sh- what was your show like when you opened for them? Was it some of your own music as well with your band uh, covers well, or? Yeah, we was we was opening for those artists back then. Is the group was called the Wilder Family then? So they had a a little R and B ballad that was kind of regional hit. But then I had arranged the show almost like what you see you seeing at the groove. I put together a show where they were doing Stevie Wonder music, Earth Wind mm-hmm. and Fire. Uh, they used to do a lot of Natalie Cole stuff because it was two sisters in the group. Uh, we did some Aretha Franklin. Um, and uh, so I just really kind of formulated the show 
to kind of whatever suited them at their strong suit as singers. Okay. Uh, but these guys always came and talked to me now, all these guys from these different bands. So I started to get these, get to know these guys, like <clears throat> Khalis Bayan from Cool and the Gang, who wrote all of the hit records for Cool and the Gang, Ladies Night, uh, uh, Get Down On It, uh, Celebration, uh, Jungle Boogie. Wow. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so I started meeting these guys. Uh, uh, and so, um, and uh, also too now hanging out with these promoters because they was taking me to these shows all, every week. I was meeting like George Benson, the dudes from Earth, Wind & Fire. Uh, 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 I met Larry Graham. I met Bootsy. I, I started meet. I met George Clinton. We kind of hit it off. So mm. I became friends with a lot of the guys in Parliament and Funkadelic. And, and uh, Wow. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned Jungle Boogie, Boogie there. Uh, yeah. There's a, you got an amazing clip on of that. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. We did a clip there and, and we was uh, we was doing a show for uh, the people player for Smokey Robinson. We was doing a birthday party for him up in up in Montreal, Canada. That clip is from from that show. So you met with Larry Graham and uh, Bootsy and uh, the P Funk community as well. So I guess that made made big influence on you. Uh, big influence because uh, my band when I at 18 mm. was called the Funketeers. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, you know, we, mm. we we swore out we was part of the the whole Parliament movement. You know, there's there's no no mistake of what genre that is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we used to dress like and wear the costumes. I used to wear this big white. Mm. People thought it was a wig, but it was a hat. <laughs> but it was like white bush, like looked like Bootsy. So it was like, you know, it was pretty crazy back then. But we, we had a conversation with Jelly Bean Johnson for, for a while ago, the, 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 okay. the, the, the drummer of the time, and yeah. uh, and he said like that. Yeah, we, we tried to dress like the funkadelic stuff kind of guy to get a contract and all of this craziness <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. that was the atmosphere of of the 70s i guess right yeah, yeah. well you know it, it it made you feel like a, a actual artist because yeah. you know you're dressing just like totally different from everybody else you know it made you feel free so it's like That's, and this is what we all want to feel. We all want to feel free, especially the music make you feel free. You want to dress, you want to feel that way too. So, 
So uh, the years went by and you yes. you gained yeah. this experience. Yeah, so then uh, 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 I'm around 22, 23 years old, after this whole situation happened with our demo tape, Joe Jefferson uh, invited me to come to Philadelphia and become an intern at Philadelphia International, working around Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff, uh, the songwriters there. Uh, these guys, at, on, at that particular time, on that label, they had Patti LaBelle, um, the OJs, the Jones Girls, MFSB was the orchestra playing behind everybody. So I was always around with them and, um, and going up to the to the recording studio every morning uh, and they were writing songs. They were just every day coming in the studio, they were writing songs, writing songs. So you start to really see that work yeah. ethic that goes on in the business. So that became part of everything I did every day. Is like trying to write songs, write ideas, prepare your show, how you can present it. The bass player got sick one time and I, they needed a new play, bass player. So they brought me down to play with the group. So that's how I got to go down to Key West and live down there. And um, I met all these jazz musicians down there. And this guy, Cordero Moffitt, mm -hmm. uh, back in 1987, he said, man, I need you to come to New York to do my album. Because this was the first start now of the smooth jazz era. Uh huh. And so I, was, I started like flying back and forth to New York to go do recording sessions. Even if you spend every dollar in the world on it. Oh, yeah. Somebody told me never change like this. And I can be the only one that's on. Gonna lie because we were friends before we became lovers. And isn't that the way it should be? <clears throat> yeah, don't change the single man. In 1989, Cadero got a job at the Blue Note as running the jam session there. And I met this guy, Ariel, uh, who eventually opened up a club called The Groove. Uh, mm -hmm. There you he opened, go. He opened up Club 101 first. Now we and, got that and, smile from Tim, I can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was at the Blue Moon many times. That whole area yeah. is fantastic. Though. Yeah, and then, uh, then uh, well, after they had several partners in the club, Club 101, uh, but then Ariel wanted his own club. So he opened up a club called Groove, and it was an R&B club. But uh, Ariel knew me as a singer, just a singer, jazz singer, in uh, in this group that I was working with, Kadara Ma. So, but so it took me years to finally get a relationship, to get a situation happening at the group because Ariel was saying, this is an R&B phone club. I don't want jazz in my club. And I was going, I'm not a jazz singer. I'm a, I'm a funk player. So it took up almost two years to convince him. The funketeers, the funketeers. Yeah, I, 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 I was like, I was like, yo, man, I'm a funk man, you know. Yeah. So, so you know, I can bring the funk in your club. If you really, that's what you really want. He said, okay, well, look, I'll give you, I'll give you Tuesday night happy hour. If you can increase my business in a month, I'll give you more nights. So that was you my took the challenge. Yeah. I took the challenge. Yeah. yeah. So once we got in the groove, it was like the magic started happening. Kept growing until I had just my own situation, working uh, three nights at the groove, three nights at Club One Hundred One. Yeah, yeah. So it's like um, uh, 
And then it, it was like a lot of people started to hear about what was going on down in the group. The music, the mixture, how we was like mixing. We were almost like a, a live band DJ because of the way we would mix songs or we would sing melodies from one song on a melody from another song and sing it over top of it. This is what Prince really liked because, uh, but we started doing that. And uh, so then a lot of people started coming down, a lot of celebrities. Shaka Khan used to be a regular. She used to come down and check the scene out. A lot of the hip hop guys, because it was like now, it was like a DJ. Uh, so we started to get a lot of guys from Wu-Tang. Uh, Jizza used to come down. Uh, Peter Guns. Uh, um, the guy Guru. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's the place to be. Eh? <laughs> it was a it was a very interesting place for musicians now to come mm. because it was it was different from a lot of the other clubs in the city because we was, the approach to music was different. It was more like combining a DJ's concept, mm. a live band concept, right, and yeah. this whole improv jazz kind of concept. It was all blended together now. Yeah. So you could all come, you could come one place and get everything. That was one of the interesting things when I came to the Grove that this band, Lenard's uh, Many Moods and, and so on, other bands there, uh, you guys know everything and you play it so well. If I closed my eyes there, I was sitting there enjoying myself in the dark in Manhattan and I was, I was like, that's Michael Jackson, is he here? This is Prince, where is he? Is he here? It was so fantastic how you did your shows. Yeah, well, well um, I put my show together well, when I was 18, 19 years old, the same kind of concept because I always wanted to pay honor to these guys that, that influenced my life. I know that, Tim, when you were over there in the States and you, you gave me a call, you were all uh, excited. Well, I was at the Groove and it was amazing. And, and, it's, uh, and when we look we at the, those clips... Tim yeah. coming to the club because Tim, uh, Tim is a music lover. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a Prince lover, but he's a music lover too. So, yeah. you, you know, we used to love his enthusiasm. And we came up and it was only black people there this this night. It was early, it was like seven or something, eight mm -hmm. maybe. And we got the seats, you know, in the middle table close to the stage. And oh. we knew all the lyrics. So we were singing to every, if it was Stevie Wonder or Prince, and I don't know if it was you or another band, but I think it was you guys. Somebody said, I wouldn't be surprised if it was Michael, that uh, to all the black people, that these two white people are more black than you. They sing all the songs, sing for God's sakes. And it, it was an amazing memory for me. I talk about that all the time. <laughs> wow. That's kind of like the vibe that was in the groove because it's yeah. like, we always wanted people to be interactive. You know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes then you'd be trying to get people, and New Yorkers, mm. New Yorkers are not one to really start to get really interactive with things. And so, it was a mix of uh, uh, regulars and uh, tourists, right? And the tourists, yeah, 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 yeah. So wow. a lot of times who would make the energy so mm. it's fun was the tourists. Because they would come in like you guys, like you said. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> God would be singing along, so then that would make them sing along. Everybody sing it out. Everybody sing it out. I felt like a, like a family member there. Well, you were a family member there. You know, this is and this is what we created. This is what I tried to create in New York because you know I'm from Virginia. So uh, and then Dean is from Trinidad and Miles is from Barbados. So uh, 
And then Mark is from Florida. So amazing mix. Yeah. I want the atmosphere to always stay where people walk through the door, just like when Tim say he walked through the door, there was all black people there, but he didn't feel uncomfortable. Yeah. No, no, and, and also that the, it changed from time to time. And, yeah. and uh, yeah. I just want to add to what you're saying that it, it, w- what I was so impressed about was that every day, if it was a Wednesday or a Friday or a Saturday, it was different. And you had the glow, you had the power. It was like you, you were not tired of what you were doing because you got energy from, I guess, different people and, and the approach to who was in there or something. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, because the thing is, it's like... We was going to play our heart out and regardless of how many people were sitting there. And and the thing was, and I, I, I've always uh, approached doing shows like that ever since I was a kid. So, uh, and I felt that if if I did that, that if yeah. I took that approach, then if I was in front of, it didn't make a difference how many people I was in front of because I was just going to do the same approach. And it was going to have the same results. So we, we, we played in front of, 10 people before also we played in front of 35,000 people before mm. and the approach was the same and the results was the same people enjoyed themselves they felt a part of you know we had people dancing people singing so the same kind of thing Prince used to come to the groove every time he came to New York. Uh, the first time he came, Shelby Shelby uh, brought him when Shelby got the 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 job working with Prince. Um, uh, Shelby introduced him to the whole village scene down in uh, uh, New York City. So uh, he really took a liking to to my project. Uh, he really liked Michelangelo's voice. He mm. loved the way Dean played drums. Oh, he, he was really, fantastic. He was really captivated the way Miles voiced chords and played keyboard. Uh, you know, so, um, and he really liked Mark Bauer's guitar playing. Uh, wow. So, uh, uh, you know, so he was always around. Not only he came to the groove, he came to this place called the Red Lion, which was really kind of, uh, uh, um, it was used to always uh, surprise us when he would pop into the Red Lion because the Red Lion is like a real uh, small bar, Irish bar. So that's on Bleecker Street. I was there oh, with you a couple Street. of times. Yeah, yeah, you came. Yeah, I love the place. place. I love the place. Yeah, yeah. Yes, because it's real music friendly, and I think that's what Prince liked about it because it's he got a really great sound in here, yeah, and it's real music musician friendly. So it's oh. like a- had to bring my sis Mate to groove. So she can experience what I share with Prince when I brought him here to hear this great band. Lenars, Vinny Blues, Michelangelo, they're playing this song tonight. They always play it in their set. You like it, my You made this song. You made it. I am. So I'm going to turn it right now to the band. It's such a shame. And y'all felt that at the Dakota when y'all started the show at the Dakota. We did that, put that show for Shelby together. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, you know, because Shelby had worked, we had, me and Shelby had put the, a thing together on Sunday nights at the Groove before she got the gig with Larry Graham and then she went on with Prince. So so we had, she had already, we had already had a chemistry, Shelby and I. So uh-huh. when she, when, uh, when, and then when, when Prince saw the show, he told Shelby, when she do her solo thing, this should be her band. Hmm. So this is kind of like how we... So <laughs> he he, like, it's, it's his blessing over it. It's his blessing, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs>
guys, it's your girl Shelby J. I want to send some love out to my brother Lenard. Oh man, me and Lenard go way back to our New York City days at the Groove at Red Lion. One of the dopest bass players on the planet. I mean, he is, like I said with Larry Graham, he's the funk of the the trunk of the funk tree. Lenard is right there. He is, you know, he he got some serious funk and. He's just been super supportive of me throughout my career. And Prince loved him when we came to Groove. Prince and I saw Lenard with his man. And when we got out to LA during the forum, Prince was like, I need that guy. I need that whole band out to do the after show at the forum. And so he flew the whole band out to come and play. And I was so proud because when I called, they were ready. They were on it. Lenard, David, they were there. They were ready to go. They say, stay ready, you ain't gotta get ready. Lenard stays ready. So just sending him so much love. Um, then I took Lenard to Australia. He got to know the Purple family. Um, down there playing Bird's Basement in Melbourne. So shout out to my brother Lenard. I look forward to seeing you soon, making some beautiful music together. You know what it is. We are together forever. And uh, that's what's up. So I love you, Lenard, so very much. Yes, I do. I'm so proud of you. And uh, keep the funk alive, man. Keep the funk going. You know, many moods and the Purple Family and all of that. So music is where it's at. And uh, we got to keep real music by real musicians going always. All right. Love you, Lamar. I'm so proud of you. Shelby came out singing and she saw us and she was like, hey, and then I said to Michael, I know that bass player, I think, on the stage there. I know the bongo man too. And we walked up there and then it was you and that was uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. funny to see. I did, had no idea you guys were there. That was a great night that night, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a great venue, great place. Huh? You did this album a couple of years ago as well, right? Um, yes, I did my own CD, Lenard's yeah. Meeting Movies, the first episode, which is uh, also to a reflection of the many styles of music yeah. uh, uh, that I was influenced by. So this is why I call my project Many Moods, because you know sometimes you're in the mood to hear jazzy music, sometimes you're in the mood to hear funk music, sometimes you're in the mood to hear rock, sometimes reggae. You know, that's all coming out of our community anyway, so. That's, that's so interesting, because that was my next topic, because I have been spending my last week here listening to that album, and I would say that, wow, they're of such a rich variety. L last track, Love, Love, it's pure like yeah. 70s. Uh, uh, take the time too. You got the reggae stuff, and uh, right. uh, we hit in the club with this. There are P funk stuff in, in that one, and uh, um, what's this one? It, it's. It's not magic, I think. It's uh, not magic. Yeah, it's like, it's like cool in the gang. Kind yeah, of. it's like cool in the gang. A little bit yeah. of temptations in it. It's like, yeah, yeah, man, yeah. Uh, and then um, so sexy. It's almost like, wow, that there we got the '90s hip hop in, all of a sudden. And I mean, it's cameo meets hip hop of 2000. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like that album. 
wow, do we really need more? Then it seems they change. Somehow got We got some new music coming out. We got some new music coming out really soon. So, uh, talking a little bit about the times we're living in now. Yeah, uh, I got the song "Everybody Dance," where it's like you know we're going through so much right now. You know, we just need we just need an outlet to like just dance, not think about any other things outside things that's going on. Just yeah. like let it just let it go for a minute, just dance. Yeah. But, uh, you know, my head is always in writing mode. So I'm always writing songs. I'm in the studio here. I'm in Warsaw, Poland right now. So we're going in the studio quite a bit, uh, uh, working on some projects. So we did a, a show not too long ago in Norway. Big show over there. It was really, really cool. I think uh, the video on YouTube now, Take the Time To, where there's a lot of shots it's in that video. Mm. It's from the show we did in Norway. Come on. Hey. Oh, take the time to take the time to hey. Look here. Hey. Oh, take the time hey, you work to... as a producer, you write, you arrange these uh, shows, and uh, you mm -hmm. got a, a lot of things to do. Uh, could you cherry pick some of the, I don't know, I guess you have been a studio musician for some and writing something and doing co and have collaborations. Mm -hmm. Could you help us pick some? Cherries from the Leonard cake. <laughs> <laughs> the cherries from the Leonard cake. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Uh, uh, well, I don't know what kind of cherries you want. No, maybe maybe around 97, 98, 99. I, I met Kali's Bayan and I became an internship with him, writing with mm -hmm. cool and the gang people. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, I was in I was uh, signed with Kali's. Uh, to his production company when he was developing a group that ended up becoming the Fugees. Oh. So I was in the studio oh. with Lauren Hill, Wycliffe. Wow. Uh, we, we was at this uh, studio called House of Music out in West Orange. That's a piece uh, of modern music history there. Yeah. 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 So, and the, the reason why my group at that time didn't start to get kind of the promotion is because the Fugees took off mm. uh, with, you know, with that song, Killing Me Softly. Mm. Uh, so, uh, but that was Kali's beyond behind that. But I was involved with Kali's for a long time, mm. writing songs. Ready or not, here I come. You can hide. I'm gonna find you and take it slowly. Ready or not, here I come. You can hide. I'm gonna find you and take you slowly. Uh -huh. well, well, um, well, one thing I would love to add is, uh, you know, I'm grateful for all of this entire journey. This has been uh, an amazing experience for my life, it enriched my life to, to have been in this business with, uh, as, as a, like a kid, I never even focused on being in this business. So it was like all the many things that have transpired over my life now it's just been amazing and now to see you even to sit here now and talk to you guys about my experience through this my journey through this and then uh to have like my playing how you described my playing earlier how you really feel it 
And that's what my playing is all about. I want people to feel it. I don't want people just to sit back. And I don't want to, I didn't never want to be like a jazz set. Like you go to a jazz club and you see just musicians playing a whole lot, a whole lot of notes. But a lot of people don't understand that. Wow. So, and they don't really feel that. So the only people that could appreciate that was people that understand so the music. I never want just musicians to like appreciate what I wanted everybody to be able to feel what, what I did. So, uh, and I think uh, that's, that's so a honest. very great ending because you you embodied a lot of that. We talk often, Tim and I, and the, the whole say what crew about listen the legacy of the legends, like taking this further on. Who who is doing that? And there are many people doing it in different ways, but. As you say, when we look at your playing and we feel it, and Tim have had opportunity to listen to it live, often it's, yeah, it's got this kind of improvisation thing. It's, it's, it's all of that in there, and it's the something true about it. So it's it's been an honor to take part of your stories here, Leonard. And uh, thank you yeah. very much. Michael. Thank you too, Tim, man, for like having me. Absolutely. Wow.